webinar for on the COVID-19 impacts on media actors, civic space, and human rights. My name is Mami Dakwa Chumberma, and I am the communications project officer for the consortium to promote human rights, civic freedoms, and media development in Sub-Saharan Africa, also known as the Consortium for Human Rights and Media in Africa. Now, this project is a project that aims to protect and expand the civic space for civil society organizations and human rights defenders, as well as nurture and enhance the effectiveness of independent media and journalism in the region. And, and in doing so, we facilitate collective action, both within and across countries. One of the results, which is this webinar that we are having today. And this project has six regional partners that is Civicus, Civil Rights Defenders, Defend Defenders, For Your Media Institute, Haber Freak, and Vitz Journalism. It is funded by the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, which is CEDA. Today, we are going to discuss, as I already mentioned, on, as I've already mentioned, and the reason we are having this, this conversation, it's quite obvious that this COVID-19 pandemic is having an impact on countries. And as it sweeps across the various countries in the region, the sub-region, it is having an impact on the access to information, what is critical in our efforts to curb its spread. Unfortunately, some governments have enforced restrictions on both digital and traditional media, such as internet, um, community radio, shutdowns of newspaper outlets, television and radio stations, like I've already mentioned, which is preventing the people, both at the grassroots level, at the national level, from accessing vital information about how to protect themselves against this virus and how to prevent the spread. So today we have quite very well-renowned um, panelists. Uh, Paul from the from Civicus, he's the advocacy and campaigns officer, Africa lead, and we have Ayodamola. Ayodamola is a premium um, works at the premium um, works at Premium Times, and that's a leading online news and investigation platform in, in Nigeria. Ayo Damola is fondly called Damola. She's a journalist, she's a trainer, facilitator, and a gender equity advocate. She has covered health services, women, children and health issues, health financings for the past four years. She has also worked in the health and diagnostic services and child rights non-governmental organization in Nigeria. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and an MSc in Information Science from the University of Ibadan, Oyo State. She also has a certificate on science solution journalism from the Rhodes University in South Africa. We also have Muthoki. Muthoki is CPJ's Sub-Saharan Africa representative, and this is based in Nairobi. She previously worked for six years as a journalist with a nation media group in Kenya, covering a variety of beats from East African community integration and regional trade to technology and te telecommunications for the Business Daily and Daily Na Nation newspapers. In 2017, she served as an alternate digital editor for the Business Daily. Then, last but not least, we have Julius. Julius is a writer and photojournalist who is passionate and committed to quality investigative research and writing on environment, immigration, human rights, crimes, Court, politics and health. He has seven years of experience of field reporting through working with the Daily Monitor, one of the independent leading media outlets in Uganda. He is currently working at the Uganda Radio Network as its bureau chief in charge of East Acholi. I'd like to say welcome to all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Mami. Thank you. So, Damola, can you kindly share with us um, certain threats and re restrictions that are facing the media during this COVID-19 pandemic? 
Mm, thank you very much. Um, well, we've not had cases of um, the government shutting down any media house. Journalists have had cases of harassment, especially from the state government and the, the security agencies while doing their duty. Um, it's cut across the country. Nigeria is a very big country. We have 36 states. And in some states... Um, Damola, sorry. Can, would it be okay with you to kindly sh um, put on your video so we can see you, if that's not a oh, problem? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it's telling me you... Oh, okay, let me see. It's telling me you've disabled it. No, I can't. You lost. Okay, our, our technicians will work on that shortly, but please, please continue to talk. Okay. So, we've had cases of harass and, um, harassment. Some journalists have been harassed. Some have been detained during them while carrying out their duties. Um, for example, in Ebony States, we have two journalists that the government even said they want to ban for life from covering anything that has to do with the state government, that they do not like the way they've been carrying information. They felt it's false information because it was not um, authenticated by the state government. And the question to ask now is, if I'm getting an information, do I need to take it to the government to authenticate the information? If you're not ready to talk to me, Okay, I should start my video. Hello, can you see me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. You're welcome. So we've had cases that um, the Peter and Chijoke was harassed by the state government. That's an important state. They were even detained for a while. And the government issued some statements that they were going to ban them from covering anything that had to do with the state. Now, one would wonder why a state government will say you don't want journalists to write on something that everybody wants to know. This is a state that already had an ongoing Lassa fever case. They had a third highest um, Lassa fever prevalent state in Nigeria. And we are wondering, how do you want to handle your COVID-19? So, it's infectious diseases. This is what everybody wants to know at this time. It is a pandemic. And you're not telling them that they cannot write because you're not writing things that you are, or you are authorizing. You want them to, you want to authorize what they should write. That means you want, they want to be the one to uh, control the press. And since so they were not being able to do this, they started arousing those guys. Now we had people that their cameras were broken during uh, the course of this COVID-19 um, outbreak because we had to, the government issued some lockdown in some parts of the states. And as a journalist, it is expected that you should go to the field to know how people are observing the lockdown. And in the process, you take some pictures and security officers actually are asking, so why are you taking pictures? And they tell you to delete it. If you try to want to prove your stance and tell them you're not ready to delete it, is that they detain you? Some people go as far as beating up some journalists. It's that bad. You, the government too in some places are actually trying to curtail what the media can get to because you want to get to the isolation center. You're telling us you have some isolation centers. Let's get to the isolation centers. Let's know what is on ground. Let's know what kind of um, bed these machines, the bed space that you have in place for people who might test positive. And you're telling them they cannot get there. So that is more or less what Nigerians have been, like Nigerian journalists have been facing. They've been having problems to access of information. You only, the most times they want to give you information from the government side. And by the time you're not bringing an information that they feel is not favorable to them, then the harassing, the harassing begins. Like um, there is a state in Nigeria that's one, I said we have 36 states. Kogi states, for example, has not recorded any case officially. Now, there is a journalist that been saying, he's been talking to people and doctors are already complaining in that state that no testing is being done at all. 
Now, if you say no testing is being done at all, and the commissioner of state information in that state is already verbally harassing that journalist and saying, where did he get his information from? Why is it peddling fake news? And that they were going to, underneath threats, deal with the person. That simply means Nigerian journalists are being careful with the way we go about our duty because you know you're not you, you're not safe. You can be arrested, you can be detained, and some people go to the point of using the the security and um, DS. There's something they call DSS. That's the highest level of um, intelligence security to arrest some journalists, and they just just realize that you can't find them. They are missing. So. That's majorly a problem in Nigeria so far. But we've been coping, we've been trying to go around it, but we've been coping. Hello? Thank you, Damola. That's, that's very insightful. That's very insightful. Um, Julius, can you, also, can you also share your experience also in this regard? Is this what you've also been facing? What is your personal experience? Hi, Julius. Okay. I think we lost him. So, Damola, I'll come back to you. Okay. Des despite all this happening and despite all these restrictions, how are the journalists able to still continue to do their work and still get the results and the data they need and if these platforms have been restricted, how do they still find a means to collaborate? If okay, um, for Nigeria, we had something they call a center data collection um, mechanism, whereby the government under the Nigerian Center for Disease Control has been given figures of infections per day. So that has been able to make us get data. We wait for the government to release, okay, this is how many people that got infected on daily basis. So that, for that, it has helped a bit to reduce our work in the terms of looking for the right numbers or the figures of people infected. But when it comes to other things, like you need to get pictures, we use sources, which is very important for journalists, as we all know. Sources are very important because there are times the government will tell you some things up there, and it is the people that are working in the health system that knows where the shoes pinch. For example, there was um, a story I did on health workers, um, the, the welfare of health workers. The government act was saying they were giving them PPE and they provided almost everything they needed. They were giving them money. They had their yeah, hazard allowances, even the, uh, that's all the health professionals, the nurses, the doctors, the uh, ward maids, and all, all, all you can think of. But talking to some of, this to some of the sources I had in the, in the hospital, we realized that those things are just being said on air. Most of the doctors working in our hospitals are actually scared of for their lives. They go to the hospital, they're working, but most of them don't even have the PPE. Some of them are infected. As we speak now, I'm sure we have over 200 doc Nigerian doctors that are infected with COVID-19. Hmm. So this is, you realize what the government is giving you is different. What you get from the source is different. Now, irrespective of the restrictions we've been trying to move, and this is where technology and the uh, phone calls comes to play. We've been trying to move, you talk to people, you ask questions, you go to the Facebook, you go to um, that, you use all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, any, any form of credible social media, you know you can actually trace and authenticate the source that pasted that information. So we've been trying to use all that to get to do the stories and to make people know what is happening. I don't know if you heard of a um, canal, for example, 
we had an issue in Kano like two, three, no, like two weeks ago, and they were not doing testing. And people were dying. And the state government was saying, no, 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 not till like COVID-19 is happening in Kano. And people were dying. So it took sources. It took sources in the hospital. It took sources from families. It took sources from people who knew people to tell us this person died. This person has died. When it was before he died, this is what was the symptoms the person was exhibiting. So that has been helping journalists to do more of their stories. Okay. Thank you very much, Damola. And before I ask Julia to speak, I'd kindly let ask you attendees that you can please send in your questions on the Q&A tab so that right after he speaks, we just zoom into that. But Jesus, we also want to know your personal experience. We know that you have a vast um, experience in this. How have you also, and journalists, been faced um, with restrictions in this pandemic era? Thank you, Mamu. Uh, my case here in Uganda, you know, uh, ever since uh, we started having these issues of uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, the government came up with a lot of uh, guidelines, you know, uh, set guidelines that, uh, you know, people should adhere to. Uh, at the initial start of it, uh, you know, some... some of the guidelines were not so much... Uh, favorable for the journalists, especially, you know, when they impose curfew, should not be on the street by 7 p.m. Wow. Hello? Hello? Am I okay? Your so, a bit low. We can hear you, but your microphone is a bit low, so if you could. Okay, 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 let me just put it up here. Uh, so it, it kind of like, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on us. Uh, before I delve into that, uh, the restriction, I wanted to give you an experience how, you know, I, I got involved into a, a chaos that, you know, nearly left me uh, with a lot of injuries at the beginning of, uh, that was on March 19th, when a uh, government, you know, gave out such directives to close down uh, uh, some of the bars, you know, hotels that were, you know, selling alcohol, you know, trying to bring in a lot of people, you know, uh, because the government initially wanted uh, you know, people to ensure social uh, distance. So with that, they saw bars and, you know, hotels as a threat. And at one time, it was on March 19, uh, at around uh, evening time, you know, I'd uh, got up some, uh, some tip and I'd gone to cover up, you know, uh, uh, the closure of uh, a bar within the municipality. So unfortunately, you know, when I, as I was doing my work, uh, you know, the security personnel, you know, out of nowhere, they felt a bit threatened with my presence there. And, you know, they jumped on me and, you know, beat me. And they even con confiscated some of my gadgets, you know, that one left me a bit uh, devastated. And I was like asking myself, why would it be a journalist, you know, being beaten while trying to, you know, uh, uh, help the government in trying to, you know, uh, uh, air out what is happening, you know, it was government, you know, uh, directive, and we were trying to just help in to hear what is happening. You know, uh, as of that time, uh, about six journalists in Uganda, you know, uh, got it rough in the hands of uh, security personnel, according to uh, a, a report that was issued by a uh, human rights network for journalists, you know, uh, an umbrella body that brings together journalists uh, within the country. Uh, to get back to uh, the restriction, you know, uh, when they imposed the curfew, uh, it meant that uh, uh, our work would be, you know, restrained. You would go in the field, but be mindful about uh, 7 p.m. And a lot of people, you know, uh, got caught up into that. Uh, you miss out on that. You are, caught, you are arrested, and sometimes you are, you know, uh, humiliated by those uh, security men. They, won't, they don't want not to, I mean, they don't want to understand whether uh, you are for a major, whether you're a journalist. You know, the directive has already been given that 7 p.m. no one should be out. It's only the military that should have been out. So a lot of radio stations, according to uh, the reports that I got, uh, you know, were affected. They had to reschedule some of their programs. Uh, you know, uh, some of them lost revenue because uh, the evening talk shows that used to be sponsored were no longer happening. It was until uh, about three weeks ago that uh, the government tried to, you know, uh, uh, relax a bit. And, you know, they now mention journalists as uh, essential uh, service providers who should, you know, uh, be given out uh, movement permits. And, you know, ever since that time, we were able to uh, 
you know, do our stories at least with uh, a little bit of freedom, not uh, like in the past. Uh, to get back to, uh, you know, what Damola uh, mentioned a bit, uh, issues of uh, being harassed, uh, you know, uh, being told by government officials, you know, do this and that, don't write this and that, simply because they want to, uh, they don't, they, they feel some of the stories that you write could be uh, of an effect to them. Uh, we, we have a task force here where I work in my area, and we have been attending their meetings. But you know, during the meetings, you know, a lot of cautions are being given out to the journalists, you know. Instead of giving them to independently uh, do their work, you know, someone gets up and, you know, the first thing they have to mention is, you journalists, you're blowing things out of proportion. You know, don't do this, don't do that. You know, a lot of people have been feeling, you know, threatened by that. Some of them even wanted to pull out of the, the, the task force meeting because, it's like they're muzzling you up. They don't want you to uh, write your independent observation of what is happening uh, uh, within the meetings. A case in point, uh, we did some story where uh, the, the district was struggling you know, to put up an isolation unit. You know, it is very critical that uh, each and every uh, district uh, task force you know, uh, committee establishes uh, uh, an isolation unit because you never know anything can happen. But the district has been you know, uh, moving from one point to the other, you know, they're trying. It almost took like one month. The district had no uh, established uh, isolation unit. And, you know, when I wrote a story that uh, they're, they're uh, you know, they're undecided on where they should have their isolation unit. Some of them, you know, uh, they got annoyed with me, you see. Simply because I came out with a story that uh, speaks out the truth. They felt like, you know, I'm trying to, you know, uh, blow their cover up, you know, what will the government think? They will be rated behind, you see? So now some of us, you know, are, are a little bit courageous to do that, but there are young journalists who, you know, feel so threatened, you know, because some of them, are they, they, they know where they stay. And, you know, such kind of uh, a, a, a threat make them, you know, uh, not to independently do their work. But... Above all, uh, you know, the government has not uh, been able to close down any media house in regards to uh, some of the, uh, the stringent measures, you know, they have put in place. But individually, there are some uh, uh, local government officials who don't feel like uh, uh, the media should be part of them. I could tell you uh, in Arua, uh, which is uh, one of the districts in northern uh, Uganda, journalists have been chased away from attending uh, the weekly uh, task force meeting. Why? Because they have been getting, you know, uh, right and information from the uh, from the uh, from the officials there, and you know, the task force meeting brings in uh, security personnel, religious leaders, you know, uh, the medical personnel, you know, the local government officials. So they feel like whatever they were speaking from there was directly entering into the ears of the journalists, and you know, they felt it wasn't giving them enough space under this one. They just made us to chase away the journalists. I don't know our fate here because some of the stories have been coming out and I kept on hearing, you know, from the background that, uh, you know, ABCD is going to be done. You may never be allowed back to, uh, to attend uh, the COVID uh, a task force meeting. So I still don't know what will happen. We are going to attend it on Friday, but already on the ground, the pressure is hard. I mean, the pressure is there for journalists. Thank you so much, Julius. This is very insightful. This is very insightful. We have quite a number of questions that have come, and it's not only for you, Julius, it's for you and Damola. Perhaps you can both decide how you will share them. But so I will just, I don't want to bombard you with all of them. I'll just read perhaps two or three at a time yeah. so that you can respond and then we'll continue. Mm. So the first question was, do you have enough medical specialists to talk to in Uganda, Nigeria? Are these infectious disease specialists or who? And in that same question, it says, who do you speak to for the epidemi epidemiology of the disease? Or do you have to rely on overseas specialists? Are medical specialists happy to speak to journalists on COVID? Well, that's quite a lot, but Damola and, and Julius, please, over to you. Okay. Can I go over? Yes, you can. Okay. Now, uh, for the case of Uganda, you know, most of the 
the the cases that are, that are coming through you know confirmed cases they are always announced by uh you know the the, the national task force members and you know they include uh, the the minister for health and uh yeah the the, the minister for health and uh some of the, 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 the big shots in government who are, 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 are the Minister of Health, they are particularly uh, the ones who give out these, uh, the cases that have already been confirmed within the, 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 the local, uh, uh, I mean, like up country here where I stay, uh, we liaise with uh, the district health officer. Unfortunately for my case here, he has really been unreliable. He doesn't pick up calls. <laughs> So most of the time you are forced to wait for what they say. If they don't talk anything, you are unable to get any information because they say there's always a spokesperson for uh, uh, health issues within uh, the district. And the second person uh, uh, within uh, you know, uh, the district is also the resident district commissioner. I don't know in other areas how they call them. Uh, he oversees security, and at the moment they have been uh, enrolled as uh, the chairperson of uh, the, the district task force. So all information regarding issues of uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, channels through them. Uh, without them, you know, you can't get uh, any other information. And they have also restricted them. You can't come out with your own uh, information. I mean, it may land you in problems. I haven't yet, but. Uh, in some other areas I read in uh, news, some of the stories that uh, they wrote uh, had some little bit of caution because uh, the district authorities have not. And in other cases, I also saw the president uh, during uh, some of his uh, uh, speeches uh, to the nation. He has also been directly you know, communicating on issues of uh, coronavirus. So it's quite complex and unless they come out with it, uh, we may not be having uh, you know, uh, direct uh, sources. We also try to speak to uh, the, the, the spokesperson of the Ministry of Health, but unfortunately at the moment, he is limited to answering uh, very few issues. Cases concerning coronavirus, most of them are, are dealt by the Minister uh, for Health. Thank you. Thank you. And Damola, briefly, what is the situation in Nigeria? So we can take other questions as well. Okay, um, very briefly, like I said earlier, the figures are usually announced by the government. That's the NCDC, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. And um, talking to doctors, we've had doctors who are willing to talk because um, we have a strong, they have a strong union. That's the health workers in Nigeria. They have a strong union. We have the Nigerian Medical Association. We have the Association of Resident Doctors. Those are the ones that work in our tertiary, that's our teaching hospitals. And uh, we have the, the nursing association. So they're always willing to talk, especially when it pertains to their own welfare and the way they're treating patients. So they've been willing to talk. Then the state governments, like Lagos State, for example, has a daily briefing, the state governor and the state commissioner for health actually give, make, gives a daily briefing with journalists so they have the platform to ask almost all the questions they feel they should be asked. Then um, aside that, you said do we have an um, epidemiologist or do we rely, the times we rely on foreign foreigners, that's the foreign expert because like we said, COVID-19 is a national, is a, is a, is a worldwide um, pandemic. It's, it's something new. So the people here do not really have all the knowledge. They too are either learning or they are looking forward or taking some things from the people that have been in the situation or in the forefront before us. But we've had good virologists, professors who are willing to share the little knowledge they have with us. And they've been able to give us insight into some of the things that governments have been saying. So this makes us query some of the results or some of the um, decisions the governments make. If you're telling us lockdown and you're telling us, okay, don't lock down, we're using the lockdown. Are you telling us this virus moves at a particular time? Are you telling us the virus does not move at a particular time? So we've had people in Nigeria who have been good resources that have been helping ourselves. Thank you. Hello.
Mami. Yes, we can hear. We can hear you, Damola. Sorry, I could hear you. My mute button was taking a while too. Yeah. So at this stage, a, everybody is muted. Please. <laughs> so there, there's a question for you, and I just want you to take a minute to answer that those two okay. questions because we we are running out of time. Okay. What measures have, firstly, um, are governments in your country supporting the media during this time and? Another aspect of the question, in Nigeria particularly, um, what measures or actions have Nigerian Association of Journalists um, taken to address the issue of harassment and threats on journalism? And I want you to use just two minutes so we go on to the next section. Thank you. Okay. Um, is the government supporting the media? Well, the government is not supporting the media. That I will say because they still try to control or stifle most of the things we do. Yes. In a way, they've been giving information, but we can still do better. We are front line. We are in the front line, just like every other health workers. But I would say they've not really been doing much. Aside the information given, that's all. You still have to find your way on how you want to get your story done. You want to find a way of how to get your sources. You have to look for ways of um, getting from one point to another without being harassed by the security agency. And there are times this government officials use those security agencies to harass the journalists because they don't want some information to be held. Now, you know, said on the issue of harassment, what is the Nigerian Association doing, uh, the Journalist Association doing? Well, we've been making noise, we've been clamoring, we've been writing articles, we've been trying as much as possible to make the government see that you can't do those things alone and you have to give freedom um, freedom to the press. It's not like we are heading it. No, we are not. We are just watchdogs. We just want people to see what you're doing and make it come out there for people to know. And when you do things we feel is wrong, we want to tell you, please, this thing is wrong. We can do it right. We can correct it. So we've been, we have been trying to work amicably, but in some cases, it goes to the extreme where government has to without say they want to detain some journalists and they take them to court and they harass them with the state apparatus and the union will just try as much as possible to maybe get a lawyer for a journalist if the journalist cannot get a lawyer or to come to the media, use other media houses to hear the stories and make people know, oh, this journalist has been, uh, has been arrested and has been charged to court. And we keep writing stories and keep writing stories to put mount pressure on the government until the government either releases the person or takes the person to court and do the day to court. So that's what we've been doing majorly in Nigeria. Okay. Thank you. It, it's yeah. quite obvious from these um, submissions from our colleagues, Julius and Damola, that it is really affecting not only press freedom, but journalist safety. Um, Musoki, can you clearly outline, perhaps briefly, the real effects, the triple down effects that's having on press freedoms and how um, the safety of journalism, of journalists, sorry, are really being affected in these times? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. It's been very interesting to listen to the conversations from Nigeria and Uganda. In response to your question, I think one of the main points I would like to make is that the stories we've had from Nigeria and Uganda are not isolated to these countries. Unfortunately, these are trends that we're seeing across the sub-Saharan Africa region, where there is a crackdown on journalists at this time, where the safety of journalists is, um, the question of the safety of journalists is up in the air. Um, if I could just speak very briefly to the actual impacts that we've seen on press freedom and journalism safety in this region, um, I would divide them into maybe um, four main categories. So one of the main ones is uh, we've seen the enactment and implementation of new laws or old laws in a way that's restrictive to press freedom. This is not something I've had been spoken about at length, so I thought maybe I could emphasize on that. We've seen this happen in South Africa. We've seen this happen in, um, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and also in Somalia. So the enactment of new COVID-19 related laws that restrict what you can say and you can report about um, the pandemic, or the use of older laws in a way that's restrictive to journalists at this time. The focus 
this has all been done under the guise of trying to control the spread of misinformation and disinformation but we've been concerned that it has uh, its its actual impact is um chilling um the critical journalism and intimidating journalists into not doing the kind of investigations that they can do at the same time across the continent we've seen uh, i mean across the region sub-saharan africa we've seen a rise in the arrests in the assaults of journalists who are either trying to cover covid 19 or who are caught up in um, security personnel trying to enforce COVID-19 lockdown or movement restriction measures. This is something we've seen in Uganda, as Julia has highlighted so clearly. This is something that we've seen in Kenya. Um, this is something that we've seen in Ghana, in Liberia also. Now, beyond that, we are also concerned about, um, this is not necessarily a safety issue, but it is a press freedom issue. And it is one that has come, repeated, come up repeatedly from Uganda and Nigeria in terms of access to information. We're hearing the same story across the continent, I mean, across the region, that journalists asking questions about COVID-19 are not getting their questions answered, they're being ignored, that governments are not providing timely information. Of course, in, in some countries, you're seeing governments attempting to um, give daily updates. We've seen this in Kenya. I think we've also seen it in Ethiopia. But still, journalists feel that the kind the, the, there isn't enough transparency about what's um, about the spread of the pandemic and also about the kind of measures that governments are putting in place in response to the pandemic. Another safety issue that we have been incredibly concerned about is just the mere fact that. There are so many journalists in this region who are behind bars at this time. This is the worst time to be behind bars. We know the conditions in which people in prison live. There are squalid conditions in many of our, in many of our countries. There is no good pres prison, but unfortunately in this region, a lot of prisons are really poor, really poor, are in really poor conditions. So another safety issue we've been concerned about is that journalists who are already detained, who were detained before the pandemic in places like Burundi and Eritrea and Cameroon, remain imprisoned at this time, and that they are therefore at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 just because they cannot social distance, they don't have access to water, they cannot put in place the kind of hygiene measures that the WHO and national governments have been advising people to put in place in order to avoid contracting COVID-19. Um, of course, there is the mere fact that journalists going out there in the field to report, to meet people, are putting themselves at risk of contracting COVID-19. So that's another safety issue that we've been trying to work with journalists around the world and with newsrooms around the world to develop safety advisory about how you can still tell the news, how you can still keep the public informed while protecting yourself, protecting your family physically and psychologically. I'm just going to pause there um, in Thank case you. you have a follow-up question. Thank you. We do not have any questions on this, but I'd also want to hear from our colleague, Paul. And Paul, I'd like to know, how is civil society responding to this pandemic and restrictions? We heard right now from Muthoki how journalists are being affected, how some may be potentially in poor conditions as they are being incarcerated. How is civil society responding to all these things that are ongoing? Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, civil society organizations, um, of course, as governments are using COVID-19 uh, as a pretext to consolidate power, restrict civic space, stigmatize the media as we've had, the civil society and the uh, philanthropy at large uh, stepping forward to provide um, and raise uh, essential information, uh, humanitarian assistance, and also to um, uh, reinvent themselves in terms of intensifying advocacy at all levels. Specifically, CSOs have initiated online materials to sensitize people about the pandemic, uh, particularly uh, in relation to democracy and how to protect human rights while protecting public health. Um, there are civil societies that are providing trainings and refreshing skills and measures on digital rights 
uh, because not only media actually or journalists are uh, uh, suffocated or stifled in terms of uh, uh, surveillance and um, uh, um, uh, digital uh, violations, even civil society organizations. So in this regard, um, they are effectively dealing with various violations caused by relevant, I mean, respective regimes, and they are contacting, I mean, they are trying to come up with uh, applications that can locate their um, fellow workers, fellow activists, uh, physical surveillance technologies to ensure that uh, um, they are uh, not monitored uh, uh, illegally as um, regimes are doing. Uh, also, they are looking for more encrypted and secure ways of continuing their work. Uh, others have used the uh, VPN, uh, signal apps, uh, security upgrades. As you know, these days, the Zooms, uh, we are using the um, uh, WhatsApps, um, very risky and, uh, you know, fragile in terms of monitoring and uh, uh, tracking uh, whatever happens. So uh, the CSOs are upgrading their security uh, um, around themselves to ensure that they continue with their work. Uh, some CSOs and activists are documenting government abuses uh, that are taking place now uh, because uh, to some extent you can, uh, in some countries, you cannot raise these issues now. A country like uh, Tanzania, you cannot uh, be allowed to speak up now, especially if it is uh, related to COVID. Um, we've heard about uh, Nigeria, Uganda, those are the issues. So they are documenting uh, abuses so that they can be used uh, later to demand uh, accountability. Uh, solidarity statements and advocacy initiatives uh, to bring um, and exert pressure on regimes have been intensified by civil society organizations and uh, statements have been raised through media uh, given to uh, international um, institutions, uh, uh, for instance, at UN, European Union, and uh, other donors and development partners to ensure that uh, activists, especially those detained or imprisoned uh, legal, illegally, um, uh, including the journalists and press activists, are released. Um, there is a continued engagement with the donors. As you know, uh, now, uh, some donors are diverting, uh, not diverting, but um, rescheduling their uh, donor commitments uh, to ensure that uh, they go to pandemic, I mean, to COVID-19 pandemic. So um, civil society organizations, and in this space, I may uh, uh, give an example of Civicas, uh, engaging with donors and development partners to ensure that there is an increased funding to civil society organizations and specifically to issues that relate to human rights, relate to civic space, relate to uh, governance, um, as uh, also we uh, continue uh, managing the pandemic. And then extending opportunity through webinars. Well, one thing that we need to appreciate uh, that uh, uh, maybe the pandemic has uh, um, brought, as I said from the beginning, we are re rethinking and uh, uh, you know, um, re-looking into what we've been doing, uh, are these webinars that would not have reached many people because we have been used to this, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, the convention of training, building the capacity, then you are limited to space and the participants you need. But these webinars have really increased the opportunities to engage with many uh, people. Of course, there are challenges of connectivity, uh, one may argue that um, we are not reaching, or these webinars may not be reaching the grassroots uh, for lack of connectivity, access to facilities uh, like computers. And uh, then there is also um, uh, uh, CSOs pertaining to collaborating and uh, working, partnering, working together to demand you no know, transparency and openness uh, in implementing the restrict, uh, I mean, uh, good uh, best practices and demanding their respective governments as they implement the restrictions around the COVID-19. As we've had 
the restrictions are so many, very uh, stringent. Uh, so um, with collaborations from the region, with collaborations uh, from um, at the national level, it is uh, helping in uh, addressing uh, the issues. For example, is like Tanzania, you know, like, like last two weeks, um, a journalist was arrested, then detained immediately. The, the how do we call it? Like um, the, the license is revoked and is suspended. Of course, there were some other issues why he was, uh, uh, you know, he did not go, uh, I mean, fulfill the standard operating procedures of uh, uh, media and journalism in the country. But also the punishments uh, that were, you know, meted to him were not proportional to the, maybe the mistake he made. But uh, the, for me, what I learned from this is the way the media, the way the civil society organizations, the way the activists came together to demand for, you know, uh, openness in all of this, to demand for transparency and how everything is being done, uh, showed me that uh, um, we are still together as the uh, slogan is in this thing, and the uh, CSOs um, are alive, uh, despite the fact that uh, um, um, we are in the distance and a little bit of disconnected. Thank you, Thank Paul. You, Thank you so much. That was so insightful. And we have, we have um, about 12 more minutes, and I see that um, our attendees have sent some questions. So I will mention some of the questions so that any of you panelists will, particularly I'll begin with you, Paul, since you haven't answered any of them. And the yes, first please. question will be, in some countries, states have targeted journalists for reporting on specific cases. For example, in Niger and Cote d'Ivoire, journalists in Niger and Cote d'Ivoire, journalists have been targeted for reporting on cases in particular hospitals. In Burundi, like you mentioned, the government seems to downplay the name and the number of cases. Have you no, it, it won't it, have you, Paul, had this experience and Damola and Julius, have you also had it in Nigeria or Uganda? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, um, uh, as a civil society organization, yeah, we keep uh, touch, uh, in touch with the members and the partners, uh, friends in these countries. Uh, a good example is, uh, you've said, is uh, Burundi. You will realize um, at one point, it took time, I mean, for them to announce that they have, uh, a, a, they had a case. Uh, we were wondering because you answer. I mean, you ask on the from the people on the ground. The answer is um, they are not testing. You know, materials don't have testing kits, facilities. But then you ask, uh, can this be documented? Can this be substantiated? No media, no journalist is willing to engage in this. Why? Because the government, as uh, um, uh, um, uh, Julia said, they are taken as not reliable. So then eventually you get a case, but even the way it is reported, the only channel, uh, example like you just said, given, I mean, uh, giving the information, for instance, in the case of Uganda, is President Museven, is the president. So you will hear president announcing, we have these cases. Then after that, a minister responds, I mean, gives. Then after that, the district or regional representative of the president uh, responds. So it becomes a little bit tricky to rely, I mean, to get the information from other sources. Uh, we have to wait um, um, uh, for the right or whatever information that is there. From the, that is the challenge, uh, that the sources are limited um, I mean, uh, sources of information are limited or uh, preserved of a few people. And uh, as um, um, uh, Dam uh, and uh, Damara said, I mean, we need uh, to respect also the space and privacy of these journalists and life, of course, of journalists. Um, of course, you will get information, it will leak, but a journalist cannot announce this information. Someone will tell you, according to the rumors, we hear this. For instance, like in Tanzania now, you hear the ministers died, you hear the MPs have died. Someone tells you a close relative of the deceased 
you know, this person died of A, B, C, D, which we think it is a, whatever, COVID. We got these pictures of people burying dead bodies at night, uh, masked and, you know, dressed to heavy with these white coats, and we think this is COVID, but I cannot publish it. So th those are some of the challenges. This information come, but um, as civil society organizations, now we cannot say, what are these dead bodies, I mean, we, these people burying dead bodies in Tanzania at this time? Some will ask you, how do you know it is Tanzania? So, uh, so th those are some of the challenges. Okay, so either Paul or Damola, can you answer so that I can also let Muthoki um, respond? Mm -hmm. That was Paul speaking earlier. Sorry, Julia saw Damola. Okay, Damola, please. Yes. Okay. Are you with me? Yes, we can. Yes, hear you. please. Okay. Um, like you said, we've had challenges and we're trying to see how we can go around it. And um civil societies have always been very wonderful, especially when it comes to journalists being harassed. We've had CPG, we have Premium Times Investigative um, Journalism Center, which is a foundation, and we've had the um, Dwali Shrinka Center for Investigative Journalism, and um, we've had uh, Amnesty International that is stand up for journalists when they are being harassed on sources of their story, because we've come to understand that we cannot always just sit down and wait for the government, or we cannot always just be their parrots and give what figures they give or whatever information they give. We have to go there to the, to the society to know what exactly is going on there. So most often we, 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 we clash. Let me put it that way. We clash because they don't want some things to come out. We get those facts and we know they are authentic facts and we have to just push it out there because we know if we don't, that means we don't get the change we want. So we've been having that issues but when it comes to figure, all figures have been given by the gov have been given by the government. So we've not had cases with that. But where we have cases is when you say somebody is dying somewhere or somebody died of COVID-19, or we want to know what exactly is going on in the state, or we want to follow the money, like we, we call it in Nigeria, because they've been releasing some funds. And we want to know, okay, what are you spending our funds on? What are you doing? Like, how much have you spent? Who did you give money? Are you buying, uh, are you buying reagents? Are you buying PPEs? Are you waiting on donations? What exactly is the state of our health system? Now, that is where we tend to start having to butt head with the government. And that's where our asset comes in. But so far, so good. We've been able to with the waters and we're doing, we're trying, we're trying. Okay. Thank you, Muthoki. And you have just two minutes because we are running out of time. Okay. Um, thank you very much again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. I thought I was frozen for a minute. I'm sorry about that. So I just wanted to make a contribution. <laughs> I just wanted to make a very brief contribution on this question of official figures and numbers. And for me, based on what we have seen is that there is the combined impact of laws that are very broad and are trying to control misinformation and disinformation, as well as an overwhelming public rhetoric um, of creating some sort of, uh, let me try that again. I think the combined impact of um, the laws that we're, tr we're seeing right now trying to control misinformation and disinformation, whether well meant or not, as well as this public narrative that we are having in many countries about COVID-19 and how government should be the source of information. The combined impact of these things is that we're seeing journalists being more cautious about questioning official numbers. There is sort of a conflation in the public sphere of truth with official information. And this is dangerous for press freedom because you are unlikely to see journalists going out there and trying to look for alternative sources of figures or numbers beyond what is being given by a minister or a president in an official capacity. Yet, if we truly want to understand the extent of this crisis, 
if we truly want to have the kind of information that the public needs in order to act for their own safety, we need journalists going out there and asking these questions and questioning these figures and being skeptical about what is being produced officially. That's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And lastly, Paul, I'd like to, we have a question on, as funders emphasize COVID-related work, are you finding that CSOs are being pushed to shift focus away from what they usually do? And please tell us that in just a minute. We have three more minutes to end this um, conversation. Paul, did um, you hear me? I, I don't think I got the question well, exactly. Okay. The question was, the question was mm -hmm. that as um, the COVID-19 is continuing, it seems yes. that uh, CSOs are being shift, pushed to shift away from their main vision and mission and what they usually do and shift to um, work related to the COVID-19. Is that, is that the case? Is that what you think? Are funders emphasizing them to do work only on COVID-related activities or not? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, some organizations have uh, mentioned so. Uh, some organizations actually are saying the, um, the donors are refusing them. Or, uh, civil society organizations who want to divert to the to, to pandemic, um, but the, then the donors are saying no. Uh, I think um, as people keep, uh, you know, as analogy is going, this is a, um, an abnormal uh, situation that requires, uh, uh, you know, stringent measures. I think for me it's a, a yes and no, uh, because at the end of the day, um, if we are talking of human rights, we need to also look at the what is urgent now, if it is a right to life, for sure to provide the food, and the donor is suggesting let's go for uh, a humanitarian you know, assistance. I think for me it's fine, uh, especially if there is a need for that. What I don't um, uh, like or what I don't uh, uh, you know, support is uh, where there is no need, then we are pushed to that side. Or where there are no expertise, there is no skill, let's say, in providing uh, PPEs, and then where the donor is pushing an NGO because of that to um, uh, any uh, push, any diversion, I think uh, must be rights best approach. And then should, uh, in this I mean, should put the people, should put all the stakeholders at the center, and they agree to um, work together. Uh, so that at the end of the day, it enhances the capacity of the recipient, it also contributes the achievement of the project. So I think uh, where necessary, uh, we need to address um, the needs of the people as they arise. Thank you, Paul. And our time is up. I just want to say thank you to all the panelists for their insightful contributions and for this rich wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us. And also to our attendees for joining for participating. And this was also live streamed on the Vids Journalism um, Facebook page. So assuming you want to go back to um, listen to the nuggets of wisdom that were shared, you can kindly do that as well. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining our first webinar and we will do subsequent ones. So please watch out for it. And thank you once again and have a great day.